again, I'm not going to get too deep in the weeds on all the, the, what I did for summer vacation stuff. Um, in part because I'm going to sort of be on vacation again for next week, but, um, it's going to be more of a working vacation anyway. Um, in part because it's just, you know, my life, not yours. Um, but so I, I told you guys before how my, uh, my wife's working on this book. I had her on the podcast. We talked for a while about it. Um, she's writing a book about her dad, who's this really amazing guy and his sort of life story. And then, you know, also what it was like growing up in Alaska and yada, yada, yada. She found there's apparently there's not apparently there is this trail that they call the peace trail, which was used originally. I mean, look, for all I know, it was originally used by Cro-Magnon because um, it's been there for a while. But it it gets its name from the fact that it was used by Jews escaping um, Germany and Austria. Um, we can talk about Austria, I guess, in a little bit. Um, during World War II, during the Holocaust. And it was also used by refugees from communism in um, as the Iron Curtain was going up. And that was uh, my father-in-law, uh, Paul, or Vladimir. I like to call him Vladimir, but... It, Everyone but his wife called him Paul. Um, he hiked his way across uh, the Alps. Um, and um, anyway, so to, to escape communists after having swum the Danube and all this other adventure stuff. And um, so my wife found, found the route. I mean, she's 98% sure this is the route. I mean, she looked at where he was and how he got there and when he got there and where where he first appeared in Italy and she thinks this must be it. And, um, and apparently people do this hike. Um, usually they start in a place called Krimmel, Austria, very pretty part of the world. Um, we'll talk about how pretty almost all of Austria is in a second. Um, and they do this hike, uh, to commemorate, you know, uh, the escape of Jews, uh, from the Holocaust. And um, so we were like, let's do it. Turns out I couldn't do it because someone needed to drive the van. We have eight family members with us um, in all. Uh, me, my wife, my daughter, and then uh, Jess's little brother and his wife and their three kids. And, um, and also, I'm just not in great shape for hiking. Um, you know, for serious long-term hiking, the, the, the West coast Gavoras, they live in Washington state are in great shape for hiking. They do a lot of hiking, um, very outdoorsy people. Uh, my daughter's in great shape for this stuff and my wife's in good shape for this stuff. And so it, it also felt weird to invite people to come do this with us and then make someone else, make my brother-in-law drive the van instead of me. So it fell to me to drive this enormous enormous Mercedes Sprinter van sits seats 10 with, with another five feet of luggage space um, across the Alps into Italy and wait on the other side to pick everybody up. So we stayed in this really cool Alpine lodge way up this private road and, you know, lots of cows and it was just really a beautiful place, even though it was pretty rainy. And, we can never, I mean, there are all sorts of weird adventure th things. Like we knew the trail ended in this place called Cesar, Italy, but we just couldn't find like the actual location anywhere. And it just sort of fell to me to like, when you get there, look around and find a place where a trail lets out and which made me a bit nervous. Um, but you know, uh, you know, my wife was right. It's like, it, it's, it's, it's weirdly opaque about how to find where this thing ends on, um, any fish, official like website or anything. And, um, so anyway, we wake up, have breakfast and, um, and then my wife and daughter and the, I'll just call them the Gavoras get ready to go on this hike over the Alps. And it was so rainy that we thought about, canceling and my wife felt very guilty about making other people do this thing. And, but the Gavoras are, are hardy people who live in Washington state where it rains a lot. And they're like, Oh no, we're going to do this no matter what, it'll be fine. And they were of good cheer. 
And so, because we had this a little bit of time, we had decided we would get the kids better rain gear, like rain jackets and that kind of stuff. Uh, my wife thought that she had a good poncho for this kind of thing. So did my brother-in-law. And, um, and I went off down the mountain on this, you know, shuttle thing to get back to my van to start the drive. So I'm driving across the Alps. The roads are intimidating, um, particularly when you're driving, a, I don't know, a 24 foot van. Um, lots and lots and lots of places in Austria where you really can't comfortably have two cars um, passing each other. Um, some places where literally two cars can't pass each other and you have to pull over and let cars pass you and that kind of thing. But it was, once I sort of figured out the turn radius stuff and all that kind of thing, it was manageable, intimidating, but manageable. Um, and then I discover that the border to Italy is only open for 15 minutes at a time every hour. And the reason for that is, um, there's literally no room for two cars to pass each other going over those passes. It is just tight, tight, tight. And if you go over the side, you die. And um, it also turned out that like the weather got worse. You know, uh, Central European weather got really, really weird in the last week. And I got caught in a bunch of different hailstorms. There were a couple passes where it was safe enough for me to take out my phone and, you know, straightaways where I could slow down and just like record the video of it. And it was bananas. And on the, on the road down from crossing the border, there was so much hail. Um, I don't think there was ever snow, but there was so much hail that the weight of the cars crushed it into a fine sheen of ice. So I'm like white knuckling it down this thing. And I somehow, for some reason, because I'm just a cheery and optimistic guy, I convinced myself that um, there's no way my family is getting this weather, right? They're higher up, they're internal. I don't know. It was all sort of stuff. And I mean, every now and then I'll be like, I hope they're not getting this, but I just didn't think they would be. Of course they were. And um, so they do this. It's a very grueling hike, at least in the beginning. And then you're on this plateau and it's it's easier. But um Turns out that the fair Jessica's rain gear was not suitable and she got soaked, you know, and it dropped to, I think dropped to the low forties, maybe even the high thirties briefly. Um, but with hail and soaking rain, they all get soaked. They're all cold. They all tell these stories about how they couldn't feel their hands and all this kind of stuff. But, uh, my wife gets so cold. She cannot for the life of her, get her body temperature back up. And every time she stops to catch her breath, she just gets really, really cold. And my brother-in-law, Matt, he apparently had a rough time too, but, um, uh, but Jess basically, uh, gets, uh, hypothermia and they, there are these huts up on the, on the trail that you can go into to try and get warm or start a fire. And they try to do that. They really couldn't get the kindling going. So they're all sort of trying to get warm around a single candle. Um, they're trying to get Jess warm. They can't get her clothes dry. You know, like, they're, you know, my daughter is kind of lying down with her. She's shaking. It gets kind of scary. And it's scary for some of the kids to see it. And so there will be debates by historians and the family for a thousand years about this. They make the decision to call, Matt has this, um, emergency beacon thing for this sort of quasi satellite phone thing. And they, they pulled the trigger and I think it was the right decision given the moment to, uh, do an SOS thing. And, uh, lots of debate about whether they all should stay behind, whatever. But, um, my sister-in-law, Sharon and the kids, they press on and go, Matt stays behind and the helicopter comes from Austrian side and picks up Matt and my wife and takes Jessica to a hospital. Of course, like a half a kilometer later, the rain stops, the kids are out in the open sun, they all dry off really quickly and they're fine. And the whole thing flattens out. 
And so the second half or the last third, I can't remember what the timing was. Because, again, I wasn't there. Um, we have talked about it a lot. Um, uh, gives out and it becomes just a really just sort of a beautiful, you know, not a stroll, but because they still had to hike for like three hours or more or something like that to get to Italy. But much more manageable, much more pleasant, much prettier because the clouds are gone, the sun's out, and they're feeling okay. And meanwhile, Jess, by the time she gets to the hospital, feels, first of all, she's embarrassed. Lots of, you know, Alaskans aren't supposed to get hypothermia jokes and all that kind of stuff aside. Um, she, uh, she's embarrassed for the family. She's embarrassed for herself. So, you know, like I told her, you know, you should just get this out there and it'll be fine. And, you know, you shouldn't, there's nothing to be embarrassed about. But, um, and she is in, you know, perfectly good shape. It just was just bad bad set of circumstances and 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 a and a bad piece of kit as the brits over here would say that she thought was more waterproof than it was um so did matt i mean matt had real real issues because he just got soaked through and apparently they're just they're much sharper distinctions between water resistant waterproof and watertight than you might think and um so anyway, she they flew on a helicopter, which apparently, which I believe, because I did once did a helicopter through the Swiss Alps. Um, they helicopter back into Austria to Zum Alsi, Zum MC, Zum Zay, I can't remember what it's called. Um, a really lovely town. Um, and she went to the hospital, spent the night in the hospital, or most of the night in the hospital. Um, and she's fine. Um, but it was quite an adventure. Oh, and the other thing, which kind of, I was thinking about actually having my daughter on here to talk about it. It gives me, it gives me agita. So the, I mean, I can't really exaggerate how much thunder and lightning we've seen on this trip. Later on when we were in, in Lake Como in Italy, one night it was literally like a lightning bolt every 10 seconds, every five seconds. I mean, a, certainly a flash like every three seconds and then an actual lightning bolt and a loud crack of thunder faster than that. Anyway, when they were on the top of the mountain at one point trying to find some kind of shelter when this lightning storm started, um, these goofy kids, they're laughing. They think it's awesome and hilarious and exciting. And at one point, Lucy turns to one of her cousins and they can see that both of them, their hair was starting to stand on end because there was so much static electricity in the air which means that like the lightning could have hit anywhere around them. And, or at least that's my understanding of it. And they thought it was funny and hilarious and so cool. And look at the size of this hail and isn't this wild. And, um, and I'm very glad they're all okay, obviously, but I'm also very glad I wasn't there because I would not have found it as cool um, and as nifty as they did. Um, so anyway, I make it over the Alps through these ice storms, through this, I mean, through these hailstorms, through this rain, um, and make it to this town of uh, Cesar. And I first, you know, with, with one of these giant sprinter vans, you, the first thought is just, can I park anywhere? And then I can walk around and look to find where to go. But so I found this place to park. Everyone was sort of nice looking at me like I wasn't that all that unusual. There was a couple RVs around. And... Um, then I saw that a lot of these like backpackers were coming down the hill from where I parked. So I walked up there and there's this massive ranger station with an educational center kind of thing. And I don't know why they couldn't have been more clear about this on the web, but um, you actually uh, couldn't have missed it, right? Like, like this is clearly where the trail ends. There's even a little, you know, monument to the peace trail. Um, by this point, I had been told you know, that Jess got hypothermia, Jess is going to Austria. So I knew this stuff was going on. The kid, uh, Lucy, my daughter turned on the location services on her phone so I could track where she was coming. I was texting, um, you know, trying to keep my concern in check and all that kind of stuff. Um, and so I eventually, once I could tell exactly where they were coming, I was like, I wouldn't say I hiked, but um, I walked up a trail a ways to go meet Sharon and the kids on their way down. And they were cheery singing sound of music stuff and all that kind of stuff. And once they knew that my wife was fine, you know, and on her way to the hospital, um, you know, there wasn't a lot of like 
real big anxiety or anything, but it was quite an adventure. And then of course, because they're stuck in Austria, they're really bummed because apparently a second helicopter from Italy was too slow. And if the helicopter came from Italy, it would have been a lot more convenient, but the Austrians got her. And so I had to wake up at like five in the morning, which is not hard for me, particularly here, um, and drive back (laughs) to Austria, pick up my wife and brother-in-law and drive them back over the Alps on that same road, which was much easier when the weather was nice. So it wasn't that big a deal. Um, and, uh, but like, that's a lot of going over the Alps in a giant van in a 24 hour period. So that was the, that was the big adventure. Um, lots of other sort of little bits to it. 